I'm talking again to my friend Miriam Kaba, usprisonculture.com, on Twitter, at Prison Culture. So, Miriam, you live in Chicago, Illinois. Um, I used to live in Chicago before before we moved to Boston here. And you've written recently on uh, just, I, I, I mean, I've read all the posts on this. It's just some of the most, uh, you know, and, and I one thing, it's like, I don't know, we, we talk about how horrible the system is, and it is. The system is, is so bad and so racist and so, you know, you, I could go on and on here. But one of the things that's so inspiring is the activism uh, of, of especially some young people who are fighting against it. Um, there's this whole uh, group of activists in Chicago who are actually working for reparations for mm-hmm. police torture that happened in Chicago. And and the, the work they're doing is just, I mean, I look at the photos, I look at what they're, the videos of what they're doing. It's just, it's just really, really inspiring. Mm-hmm. Tell us about the group and tell us about what exactly they're working for. Sure. Um, so, Maybe you're, I don't know how many of your listeners already know uh, the story of John Burge, who was a um, uh, first a captain and then a commander here in Chicago, in the Chicago Police Department. Um, he started working in the Chicago Police Department in 1972. Um, he came to the police department right after he had served time in Vietnam. He, um, when he got to uh, area two, um, which was the place where he started working, he right away began a regime of systematic torture of black people, um, in that particular area, along with other officers who were more his, who were his subordinates. Um, and they did it for, uh, documented for at least 20 years, um, until finally, uh, People who had been coming forward for years to talk about that torture were finally believed because of some articles that came out in mag- in um, newspapers uh, in the city and because of people continued and persistent activism. He was finally fired uh, in 1993, um, but it took another, uh, you know, 20 years basically to get him in front of, uh, into court um, where he was finally um uh, prosecuted, but he was only prosecuted under perjury, so that he lied about the torture. That's all they could get him <laughs> on, because, again, I think the statute of limitation had expired. Um, nobody had been able to get him before. He was basically protected by the Chicago political elite, including um, Richard Daly, who had been uh, a state's attorney and never took the cases, uh, and he became then our mayor, uh, you know, after his father. So, um, so anyway, so Burge, um, there are documented cases of over 120, mostly all the people that are documented are men. There were allegedly women who were tortured, but nobody's been ever able to like specifically identify them and their names, but they were all black men. Um, and some of those men were tortured into confessions, which put them on death row. Um, so some of the death row, uh, men who had been uh, basically, uh, you know, put onto death row for false, basically false confessions, got their sentences commuted by George Ryan, interestingly, who was our, one of our uh, governors who ended up in prison himself, too. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so, you know, so over years and years and years, some of those men still are behind bars today or the torture survivors. Long story short is, um, in two, about 2013, uh, a group called... Um, uh, uh, the Chicago Justice Torture Memorials, um, which came together to kind of talk again about the torture survivors and um, the cases and to bring more of an arts focus to that, to do these, to ask people to speculate and think about public memorials that can be done about this torture because so many people live in Chicago and they don't know anything about this like horrible, you know, history of what was going on with people. Um, I mean, I don't want to say, you know, lots of the torture was putting, you know, remember when we had those typewriters that had like the plastic covers on them Mm -hmm. years ago? They would use those plastic covers to suffocate people. They brought back from Vietnam, he brought back this box that was called the telephone box that's basically based on, uh, so you would put, like probes on that, um, and, and, like, and then it had a crank that would bring, make it, like, put electricity, and they would take those pods and they would put them on people's genitals and twist the, and, uh, you know, crank that particular crank, and that would re- electric shock people's genitals. Um, they did a lot of other horrific things to people, beat people, you know, horrifyingly. Um, anyway, so now, unfortunately, 
a lot of the torture survivors who were released or who were exonerated, because there are a bunch that have been exonerated from jail, um, they, they left without any resources. They can't, their statute of limitations ran out. They can't take their cases any way to get compensation. And so they're left with mental trauma, no jobs, no opportunity to be able to, quote, reintegrate, and no money. And so um, so uh, this is interesting, right? Because as I mentioned before, this started in 1972. There have been people who've been fighting since the 1970s around these cases, first to make them come to light, and then yeah. to get, quote, justice for the people who were impacted. And one of those is a man here in Chicago called Stan Willis. And Stan is a black attorney who um, started Black People Against Torture. And Stan was the one who came up with the idea, like in the 80s, um, that they should take those cases to the United Nations and that they should present to the United Nations Committee on Torture these particular cases um, so that the UN would weigh in and give more of an opportunity to fight you know, um, in court and to be able to, like, really make this become an international issue. Stan is also the first person who started talking about reparations a while ago and saying, you know, they deserve reparations for what happened to them, the harm that was caused by the city of Chicago, but not just by those police officers, but by the entire city structure. They deserve to get that. So a reparations ordinance was put together by the Chicago Justice Torture Memorials Project in October. It was filed in the city council. There's been work done from 2013 to now to get aldermanic sponsors. So now we have um, we have 28 aldermanic sponsors technically on the bill that say they're in support of it. That's more than the majority that's needed to pass it in the city council. What it needs now is a hearing in the finance committee, um, and then it needs a floor vote. And uh, the person who runs the finance committee is Edward Burke. He's one of the mm-hmm. older people. And he really, we found out that, you know, he usually gives people hearings. But we found out that the Rahm Emanuel and his administration are the ones who are blocking our opportunity to get a hearing. And that Rahm Emanuel, even though he has talked about this torture uh, being a, quote, dark stain on, you know, Chicago, is not willing or has not been willing to declare his full support for the reparations ordinance. And he has not been willing to actually make that you know, a priority to make sure that these people have some modicum of justice. So a group of us, including my organization, Project NIA, um, Amnesty International, um, the local chapter here, um, Chicago Justice Torture Memorials Project, and We Charge Genocide, have gotten together to kind of reanimate the push on these reparations projects. Um, and partly this is also in response to We Charge Genocide, the group of young people of color who went to Geneva in November to present the case of basically that the Chicago Police Department has been engaged in to- uh, genocide for years here yeah. against particularly black people um, and specifically the young black people. Um, they, when they took their case to the U.N., the U.N. did several things, but the U.N. also uh, reiterated that Chicago the city should pass this particular ordinance. They call that out specifically in the report. So we're using all these opportunities to reamplify the case and to push for some actual justice um, around what has happened to these, you know, these men and overwhelmingly what has happened to these black men. We want reparations. We want this chapter, horrible chapter in Chicago's history to be taught in Chicago public schools. We want a community center on the south side of Chicago that will provide counseling and uh, mental health support for torture survivors that are indigenous, meaning torture survivors from Chicago or from the U.S. You know, right now we have a torture center called the Culver Center that only works with overseas people who have been tortured overseas but not people who have been tortured right here in our city. So we want a community center for that. Um, we want free education through the city colleges for all of the torture survivors that want to use it or their families. Um, So there are a whole series of things in the reparations, and people should read it. Um, If you go to chicagotorture.org, you can see the ordinance there. Um, And it's actually a pretty beautiful document. Um, And it's also a great example of abolition. 
And I said to somebody the other day, I had made that comment a while ago that, you know, when people ask what is what does prison abolition look like or what does abolition look like writ large of the PIC, I'm always like trying to explain to people and you know, you've got a lot of people having kind of abstract analyses of that. And we talked briefly about um, abolition last time we talked. Um, yeah. But this is a great abolitionist document, um, the reparations. So people want to know what that really looks like. Read the, read the reparations ordinance. It's a beginning. 